All right, so far we talk about differential cryptanalysis. We have seen a different variation called impossible differential cryptanalysis. So now we are going to talk something between these two methods called improbable differential cryptanalysis, which can be also seen as a generalization of the impossible differential cryptanalysis technique. So let's recall the historical introduction. We said that differential cryptanalysis was uh, discovered by Biham and Shamir in early 1980s. AIM is to find the path, sometimes called differential characteristic, so that when the input difference is something fixed like alpha, the output difference is better with high probability. So actually truncated differential cryptanalysis, a generalization of this, is the same with this technique. So the definition is almost identical. Find a path, sometimes called differential, so that when the input difference is alpha, output difference is better with high probability. So the definition is the same, but the only difference is that in truncated differential cryptanalysis, only parts of the differences alpha and beta are specified. So in this scenario, if the block size is, for instance, 64 bits, we explicitly tell what are the differences on all of these 64 bits, like saying that this bit has no difference, and we denote it with zero. And if it has a difference, we denote it with one. Here, we don't, we are not interested in some of the differences in some of the parts of these inputs or outputs. So we can simply use a question mark there saying that it can be either zero or one. The attack works anyway, okay? So sometimes this gives you more freedom. Impossible differential cryptanalysis is different than these two techniques because in this scenario, your aim is to find an Pat again, but we will call it an impossible differential. So that when the input difference is alpha, the output difference is never better. So here uh, we had high probability. Here we have zero probability. Now the question is, can we have something with this definition? Since zero probability is allowed, so can we have something, you know, not zero but close to it? So yes, there are other variants too. So, statistical attacks on block ciphers make use of a property of the cipher so that an incident characteristic differential occurs with different probabilities depending on whether the correct key is used or not. So our aim is to first find the distinguisher. So the distinguisher uh, happens with different probabilities for the cipher and the random permutation. Then when we try to capture the key, uh, that probability for the cipher works for the correct key. But here we assume that wrong keys work like a, a random permutation, which we call it a wrong key randomization hypothesis, so that these two binomial distributions also are mapped to finding correct and wrong keys. So we call differential and truncated differentials. So the distinguisher works with probability P for the random permutation and with probability P0 for the cipher that we are trying to distinguish. So it can be R rounds of a cipher. So this probability is valid for the correct key, and this probability is valid for all of the candidate wrong keys. So here, P0 is larger than P. And in the impossible differential, we said that uh, that differential, that characteristic, works with some probability for a random permutation. So for the wrong keys, we can still observe that differential, but we can never observe it for the correct key. So P0 is now less than P, but it is exactly zero. So the question is, can we have something like this? Statistically, this would work because our aim is to distinguish two different binomial distributions. So it doesn't matter which one is has the higher probability, right? So if you can find such a distinguisher, and we will call them improbable differential, where P0 is less than P, then you can you know, capture the correct key where the correct key, when you keep counters for the candidate keys, the correct key will have the lowest counter. And in this scenario, you would have the highest counter for the correct key. So question is, yes, statistically, this would work. By definition, this would work. But the question is, how can I find the differential, which would be, uh, which will have a lower probability for the correct key than the wrong key? So this is the question. So here we are going to do something like uh, miss in the middle technique. So. Assume that alpha and beta differences are observed with probability P for a wrong key. 
Obtain a non-trivial differential so that a pair having alpha input difference and beta prime output difference with probability B prime, where beta prime is different than beta. Hence, the correct key probable for the correct key, probability of observing these differences becomes P times one minus P prime. So as you can see, since this is a value less than one, when you multiply something with less than one and larger than zero, P0 will be larger than this, sorry, smaller than this, since you're you know, multiplying this with less than one, something less than one. So, of course, you have to be careful about when you're constructing this kind of stuff. So you should actually experimentally verify it. So I will show you with some pictures to explain what that means, okay? So one method is to use two differentials that miss in the middle with high probability, okay? So, uh, in practice, I never did done this, so you should check if it works, but idea is the same. So recall the miss in the middle technique, where in that scenario, these probabilities were one. So alpha went to delta all the time, and beta came from gamma all the time, and they were different. So we said that this is impossible, right? But now I'm saying that instead of having probability once here, maybe have something like 0 0.999 or something. So this would mean that alpha uh, goes to delta with probability P1. So beta has to come with probability P2. So we multiply with this. So with this probability, uh, alpha will go something than, different than beta. But if you make one minus this, so with that probability, alpha may go to beta. So that is the idea. So let me show you how uh, we can expand impossible differentials to improbable differentials by adding a differential to the top or the below of the impossible differential, which we call the expansion technique. Idea is this, so you have a impossible differential. So delta never goes to gamma. So this has probability one. So with probability one, delta goes to something else. Okay. So idea is as follows. Find a very, uh, differential with alpha uh, going to delta, which is a very high probability, this would mean that alpha will go to delta with P, probability P1, and it will go something else than gamma because delta never can go to gamma, right? So if you follow this path, then you will, go, you will never go to gamma. But with some probability, which is one minus P1, alpha will go to something other than delta, then this one may go to gamma. Okay, so this is why we say one minus P1, okay? So this way, so what idea is as follows, if this probability is really large, this would mean that alpha will go to delta most of the time, and it will go something other than gamma most of the time, but rarely it will go to something else, and that something else may have a chance to go to gamma. So if you make a randomization hypothesis from here to here, this would happen with probability P as in the case of this one going to this one for a random permutation. But since you are all most of the time go here, you go something else with probability one minus P1 and with probability P you go here. So P times one minus P1 comes from here, okay? I hope I could explain this clearly. So you can do the similar thing from bottom. So you can obtain saying that alpha goes to beta <clears throat> with probability maybe P times one minus P one times P two. Okay. So what is the benefit of making this using this expansion method? You can have longer differentials because at the impossible case, you have this many runs, but maybe you want to attack more runs so you can have a longer distinguisher. This is the nice thing. And when you have longer differentials, you add more runs so you can attack more runs. Uh, the negative part of this expansion method is that now the data complexity increases because P0 increases. Because at the impossible case, you definitely know if it is the correct key or not, right? Because if you observe the differential, you say that, okay, I observed it. So, you know, this cannot be the correct key. But now for the correct key, I can still observe the differential. So I need to use more data to be able to distinguish two differentials, uh, sorry, two, yeah, two binomial distributions. Uh, so you have to use more data, but if you use more data, since you are going to work on all of the data, you would have to perform more 
uh, operations, so your time complexity also increases. Finally, memory complexity increases because now we need to keep counters for the guess keys. Think about impossible differential, we only kept a counter saying zero or one, saying that if it is correct or not, right? Now I have to keep counters for the, until the end of the attack. Then I will, you know, uh, sort them from lowest to higher. So the lowest one will be most probably be the correct key. Okay. So without finishing, let me give two examples. So here I gave a general definition and gave the idea. But when we go back and looked at some of the previous attacks in literature, we observed that people did some specific attacks on ciphers where P0 is actually less than P. So this kind of thing can happen. Actually, in linear cryptanalysis, since we are talking about the bias, you know, for random permutation, that's property occurs with probability one over two in linear cryptanalysis. And for the correct key or the distinguisher, we will have one over two plus or minus some bias. So if it is plus, then it's a, P0 will be larger than P. If it is minus, then P0 will be less than P. So in literature, we already have this kind of scenarios anyway. But this is the formal way of explaining all of these attacks in general. 